we were on our honeymoon last week, and I don't remember when it was, but Sister Ada asked me, what is your topic at the renewal? I guess either I had neglected to tell her or she had forgotten in the midst of all of our wedding preparations. And I said, well, it's, uh, my topic is the Holy Spirit and subduing the flesh. And she began to laugh. And I must say that I don't stand up here as a person who has perf been perfected. I'm a man just like you are. You know, a lot of people uh, think that ministers somehow that we've arrived. And sometimes I've known that ministers actually are the ones with a lot more problems than the people's in the pews. But as Paul said, I, I strain forward to what is ahead. I haven't been perfected yet. I wish I could stand up here and say, well, just read this book. I have this book here, Seven Steps Toward Perfecting Yourself and Subduing the Flesh. You know, I wish I could do that. I wish I could just give you all a book and say, here's this book that I've written. Here are my degrees to back it up. And if you just read this, these seven steps, then you'll, you'll, you'll be sure to subdue the flesh every time. I wish I could do that. I wish it were that easy. I really do. But it's not that easy, and I haven't written that book yet. The Holy Spirit and subduing the flesh. I want to take this entire message from the 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters of the book of Romans. And I'm not sure what kind of message this is. You know, in Bible college, you talk about topical, and you talk about textual, and you talk about expository sermons. I'm not sure which kind of sermon this is. I would like to think that it's expository. I want to read a verse, several verses from each one of these chapters. I'm not going to take the time, obviously, to read all three chapters to you. But I want to begin by reading a section of text from each chapter that I've selected. First, Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 14. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Now look at chapter 7, verses 14 to 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand, for what I will to do... That I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do to do that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And one final selection from chapter 8, 
verses 12 through 17. And we'll be referring to several other passages besides the one that I've read in each one of these chapters, but we'll read chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, as I said, we'll be referring to some other texts there in Romans 6 through 8 as this message unfolds, but I, I thought that those selections that I just read for you kind of... Uh, define the main point of this message the Holy Spirit and subduing the flesh I'm not just gonna talk about subduing the flesh I'm gonna talk about the Holy Spirit and subduing the flesh Amen. and there's some difference there Amen. it's already been said but I'll say it again you can't subdue the flesh without the Holy Spirit Amen. you may be able to achieve a measure of success it may look like to all of your friends at church that you're subduing the flesh without the Holy Spirit but in fact you cannot subdue the flesh without the power and the help of the Holy Spirit and that is the point of Romans 6 through 8 I suppose we should define the flesh what is the flesh what do we mean when we say that sometimes we use religious words and we don't know what they mean what is the flesh well the flesh is the most temporal part of man the text that was already read during our song service was all flesh is grass all their beauties like the flower of the field the grass withers and the flowers fall that's flesh flesh is temporal there's a part of us that's not temporal there's a part of us that will exist or live forever but there's a part of us that won't and that's the flesh flesh is attractive and strong only for a season we may be young, we may be strong, you may be good looking like me, but after a while you're not. You get old. You're flesh. You may even be a flower. You know, flowers don't even last as long as grass. So if you're a flower, you're, you're probably going to go a lot faster than the rest of us. <laughs> you know, I, as I was thinking about that, I, I thought, you know, that could really be a source of despair. If if all we had was the flesh that's depressing and that you know that is what the book of Ecclesiastes is about thank the Lord we have hope and we'll talk about that hope this morning flesh is the fallen part of man flesh is the opposite of the spirit you know there's a lot of opposites in the Bible light and darkness God and Satan and flesh and spirit those are like opposites flesh can't be changed because Jesus said that which is born of flesh is flesh flesh has no significance in spiritual realms because Jesus said the flesh counts for nothing and flesh has no place in the kingdom because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. So like my brother said earlier in the week, you've got to be more than just human if you want to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I'm thankful that man is more than flesh. Amen. We're not just flesh. Now, if you're an American, in our culture, sometimes it's hard to believe because all we emphasize is flesh. But scripture tells us that man is a spiritual being. We have a spirit, not just, we're not just a body or an organism. We're spiritual beings. Now in dealing with this truth of subduing the flesh, human philosophy has gone, tend to go, gone to extremes. Human philosophy usually goes to one of two extremes. One ex extreme is where you beat your body. Uh, we call it asceticism, where you 
you beat your body and you starve yourself and you do certain things that, that you try to discipline your body and bring it into subjection that way, harshly. Asceticism. And then human philosophy has also adopted another extreme with, with the flesh, which really doesn't have anything to do with subduing the flesh. We call it hedonism. You just kind of indulge the flesh. Don't worry about subduing it. You really can't anyway, so just live it up. Just, you know, if it feels good, do it. Human philosophy goes to extremes, but Scripture condemns both of those extremes explicitly. Paul talked about the law of the harvest. You know what the law of the harvest is? It says, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. That's, that's the law of the harvest. And the other extreme, asceticism, Paul wrote, these things, that's asceticism, beating your body, harsh treatment of the body, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body. Listen to this, though. But are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Amen. You can beat yourself all you want and you'll still lust. You can beat yourself all you want and you'll still have desires. <laughs> no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So I'm not going to talk about some type of system of discipline this morning. I'm not going to give you, you know, three ways that you can fast and pray and this sort of thing and guarantee you that you, although we're not against those things, I mean, we, fasting and praying is something that Christians do. We just do that. But, but that's not the, the point here this morning. As I studied Romans 6 through 8, there's something very important that came actually in the entire context of this section of Romans, beginning in chapter 5. It becomes very clear that man has a sinful nature that he has inherited from his father Adam. Now I know there's some controversy, there's some theological controversy surrounding that affirmation that I just made, but I, I want to say that again. Man, and this is what Paul is saying in Romans, starting in Romans 5, that man has a sinful nature from father Adam, but Adam's race has been condemned. Amen. That's why you've got to subdue the flesh. That's actually the scary part. That if you don't subdue the flesh, you'll go down with Adam. That, that's actually the, the part of this sermon and this text that kind, of, that kind of jars me awake. That if I don't subdue my flesh, even if I started out good, even if I started out with the Holy Spirit, and every believer starts out with the Holy Spirit, you know. But if I don't walk in the Spirit, if I don't put to death the misdeeds of the flesh, I will not live. Amen. I will die. Amen. Adam's race has been condemned. Now there is, I want to get technical for just a minute, but I, I think that you can handle this, and I think this is necessary. I read out of the New King James. Several of you have that version, or the King James Version, or maybe the New American Standard Version. Some of you might have the NIV. I was an NIV reader. And when you read... The NIV in Romans 6, 7, and 8, you don't read about flesh, you read about the sinful nature. Brother Dave and I were having a nice friendly discussion about this the other night. In Greek, the word flesh, sarx, that's all Paul says here. And so most of your more literal translations just translate it flesh. They don't translate it sinful nature. But the NIV is a, what we call a translation that's dynamic equivalence. And they're not just translating the word flesh, sarks, they're translating the idea. They're, and I agree with the New, Amer the New International Version's translation. Paul is not just talking about your body, he's talking about the nature of flesh. Here. Now there are other places we could go where flesh just means flesh. Just means your body. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not just talking about your body, he's talking about the nature of flesh. And so the sinful nature is what Paul is talking about here and I'm just gonna proceed with that assumption with that presupposition I'm just gonna proceed in this message that you and I have a sinful nature and that is what Paul's talking about here Amen. now in Romans chapter 5 Paul nails that down this aspect of Adam's race and this is kinda of devastating to some theology that I've been taught but nevertheless this is what the Bible says Romans 5.18 says, As through one man's offense, that's Adam, judgment came to all men. 
resulting in condemnation. In verse 19, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. See? I'm, just, I, I'm not going to try to explain that. I'm just going to believe that. Amen. That I have a, I have a fallen part. I, I have a fallen part. You do too. We all have Father Adam. And that's the point that Paul is making. And the reason I wanted to nail that down and emphasize that so strongly is because we need to avoid two false views of man's nature. There are, there are other people that have opinions, you know, about the nature of man besides the Scripture. And we need to avoid these two false premises about man's nature. One is modern liberalism. Modern liberalism says that man is inherently good. And that is a contradiction of Scripture. The other view we want to avoid is the psychological view. Psychology says that it's your environment. Everybody, psychology, humanistic psychologists say that man is basically good. It's just man's environment. See, you know, you got bad parents, you know, something, you know, you don't grow up with enough money or something like that. It kind of ruins a kid, you know. That's why when you go to the counselors, they always ask, you know, do you hate your mother or something like, stupid like that, you know, because they're trying to find out if your environment is the reason for all of your problems. So we want to avoid those false views. Now there is some human responsibility in subduing the flesh. Amen. We do have a part to play. We're not passive in this at all. I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and just say, just let go and let God. That's, that's not my message. I'm not just saying, just let the Holy Spirit just kind of carry you along and, and the Holy Spirit just kind of, you just kind of shift into automatic pilot, get some kind of second blessing, or reach some kind of high spiritual plateau where you can't sin anymore. That's not scriptural. We have a responsibility. We have part to play. One of the responsibilities that we have is discipline. Now again, remember what I said. We can't go to extremes. We can't end up with asceticism, but we have received a spirit of discipline, Paul says. That's to Timothy. Paul says, I buffet my body and make it my slave. You, we can do that. We can. I don't think Paul said that he was practicing asceticism. He's, mainly, he's merely saying, I make my body do what it ought to do. I rule my body. My body doesn't rule me. That's basically what Paul's saying. And that does say, I buffet my body, not I buffet my body. <laughs> However, discipline has a limited amount of effectiveness. And the same Apostle Paul that said, I buffet my body, he also told Timothy, bodily discipline is only of little value. Yeah, it's of some value. You know, let's all become athletes. Let's all just exercise. Let's all just go on diets and exercise and lift weights and jog every morning. Surely that will help us subdue the flesh. Well, it might a little bit, I guess. But it's only of little value, Paul said. Part of our human responsibility for subduing the flesh is our religion. I'm using religion in the sanctified sense, not in a negative sense. Our religion should help subdue the flesh, not encourage the flesh, or it's not from God. Amen. You know that other worldly religions, they, like Buddhism and Shintoism and Islam, some of these other weird world religions that are actually becoming very popular in our country, if you didn't know that, they have some, some success in subduing the flesh. Did you know that? Now, it's a limited success, but I'm, I'm kind of amazed at these uh, Muslim people, you know, that, that pray five times a day. Doesn't matter what's going on or if it's inconvenient, or they pray five times a day, you know. But that is not necessarily the Holy Spirit. We may have some type of external success, limited external success in subduing the flesh, but that may not be the Holy Spirit. You may be a whitewashed tomb with dead man's bones on the inside. Many of these other Worldly religions subdue the flesh, not according to the Spirit, but according to law. Amen. 
And there's all the difference in the world. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit later. Okay, I want to go into Romans 6 through 8. I, I was trying to figure out what kind of sermon this was. And I, the best terms that I could come up with is this is a contextualized expository sermon. How's that? That's impressive, isn't it? <laughs> but we're not going to consider just one passage here in Romans 6 through 8. We're going to consider the whole flow of the whole context because the flow of this context here is about subduing the flesh from the beginning of chapter 6 to, be, to the end of chapter 8. And Paul basically here makes three movements in his thinking as Romans 6 and then 7 and 8 flow along. The first movement is what I have labeled death and freedom. Death and freedom. You know, in the kingdom of God, death comes before life. We, we have to die first before we live. And of course it's in a spiritual sense. And Paul says in chapter 6 and verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And in verse 2 you know that. God forbid! Certainly not! No way! Very strong Greek negative. No way! We should not continue in sin just so that grace may abound. In other words, what he's saying is, is that sin is illogical for the spiritual life. Sin is illogical for the spiritual life. Because you're dead, see? You're dead to that. And there's always somebody, it seems, that is tempted to use the grace of God as a license for sin. Well, you know, if God will forgive me, right? God will forgive me. And I like what Brother Leon said in the testimony. Do we want God, the God of grace or the grace of God? Well, some people want just the grace of God, and they use that as a license, and Paul immediately squelches that and says, no, that is, we can't do that. Sin is out of character for spiritual life. In other words, actually, when Christians sin, that's, out, that's not normal. It really isn't. That's abnormal. Now, you know, people in the world who aren't born again, that's, their sin is actually quite normal, you know. When worldly people do something good, it's like, wow, huh, look what they did. Can't believe that. But when Christians sin, that's something, um, unfortunately in the church today, it's almost becoming normal. I, mean, I hate to say that, but we should never treat sin like it's normal in the church. It's not normal. It's never normal. It's out of character. A spiritual person is alive and dead at the same time. Verse 2, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? And look at verse 11 of chapter 6. Likewise, you yourselves reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you're dead and you're alive at the same time. Amen. Actually, you're dead to sin and you're alive to God. Now, Think about this. For a person who's not born again, it's the exact opposite, isn't it? A person who's not born again, they're dead to God and alive to sin. Or dead in sin, Scripture says. A spiritual person is actually more sensitive to God than to sin. A person who has a new nature, a person who's been born again... We're more sensitive, we have a part of us that's more sensitive to the will of God than to the desires of the flesh. Amen. And Paul is saying, live according to those desires. Amen. Freedom is the result of death and new life. Verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. You want to be free? You got to be dead. Amen. You just got to be dead to the right thing, that's all. Got to be dead to sin. Now, Paul, to, to, to drive this point home, in the rest of chapter 6 and into chapter 7, Paul illustrates, uses three illustrations to, to drive this point home that you're dead and you're free, and you're free because you're dead. The first illustration that he uses is the illustration of our baptism. And, uh, you know, I don't, there's a lot of controversy, again, surrounding this text and baptism. And is Paul talking about the water? Is he talking about the spirit only? And, and the answer is yes. It, well, it is. Is Paul talking about water? Or is Paul talking about just the Holy Spirit? Well, yeah, that's, that's right. 
So there's no need for controversy, and I'm not even going to go into that. But what Paul says here about your baptism, he's saying, think back to your baptism. You re you can, all of us can remember when we were baptized. And Paul is saying, that is the point in time where you participated in the death and resurrection of Christ. That, that's the point where you, you didn't just die, you died with Christ. Amen. Amen. You didn't just live, you lived according to the power of the resurrection. Amen. You participated in that. And see, all of us can look back and we can remember that point in time when we participated in the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. That's when the old life died and the new life came. That's when it happened. The new life that you got from God is more powerful than the old life of sin and the flesh. Amen. See, so it is possible for us to subdue the flesh because what you got from God is more powerful than what you got from Adam. Amen. The second illustration Paul uses is the illustration of slavery. Let me read a verse from chapter 6. Verse 17 and 18. Actually, let me go back up to verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Spiritual people are no longer slaves to sin. Spiritual people are not controlled by the sinful nature. Amen. The only time we, we might become controlled by the sinful nature is if we give in to it and allow ourselves to be enslaved by it again. But every believer who has the Holy Spirit and has this new life from God, you've been set free from your sinful nature. You're no longer controlled by the sinful nature. We're not debtors to the flesh, are we? That's why you're not a debtor to the flesh. Actually, you know, everyone's a slave to something. Amen. Jesus said, you know, if, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. And we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to God. Now, you're still a slave, but, you know, some people say, well, I don't want to be a slave. I want to be free. Well, the only problem with that is, yeah, you can be free. But if you're free and you're not a slave to God... That leads to death, Paul says. The wages of sin is death. That's the end of chapter 6. If you're, if you're a slave to sin, it leads to death. But if you're a slave to God, it leads to holiness, and holiness leads to eternal life. Amen. So if I'm going to be a slave, I want, I want to lead to eternal life. And the third illustration that Paul uses is the illustration of marriage. Now, of course, you know, just last week I was married, and I've noticed something just in the last week or so that I've been married. You know, I can't do what I want anymore. When we, when we started traveling, you know, we were going to travel here to, uh, well, we were, first we had to travel from Florida up to Tennessee, and then we are going to travel from Tennessee to here. And I told Ada, you know, well, we'll just drive the whole thing. You know, we'll start in Tennessee, we'll just... We'll just drive it straight through. That's what I want to do. She said, no, I don't want to do that. So guess what we did? <laughs> we stopped. And all of you, everybody knows that that's what it's like when you get married. You know, you don't just do whatever you want anymore. You've got to think about who you're married to. And wives is the same with your husbands, not just husbands. That's what it's like being married. Well, you know, we're married to Christ. We don't just live and do whatever we want to do. We do what He wants to do. And it's not, a, it's not an obligation sort of thing, you know. It's that I love you sort of thing. Amen. Paul makes the point that when we died, our marriage to the law ended. Amen. Therefore, see, it's not an obligation sort of thing. It's a different kind of marriage now. Amen. The law didn't change. You changed. God didn't say, well, you know, they can't keep the law, so maybe I'll just take out a couple of those commandments. Well, God didn't do that. Instead, you died. Amen. 
And when you died, you're not married anymore. And so when you died, you died to the law, and when you were raised again, you were married to Christ. You have a new husband. And our spiritual union with Christ makes us productive and useful to God. Let's read verse 4 of chapter 7. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. The second movement in Romans 6 through 8 is what I have labeled conflict and sonship. Conflict and sonship. When we talk about subduing the flesh, it's like Brother Al said yesterday we're in a war, we're in a struggle. This is not something that we can just talk about flippantly and say, Yeah, I've already done that. Yeah, I've already accomplished that in my Christian life. We can't say that. This is a a conflict, a constant conflict. But actually what Paul is saying here and what we all need to understand is that that conflict itself proves that we have that new life from God. Amen. If there was no struggle, if there was no conflict, that would just prove that you're dead to God. But since we have this conflict, since we have this constant struggle, that proves that we actually have that new life from God that lives within us. Amen. Now, this struggle is not something that you can always see. You know, when you come to your assembly here at First Christian Church, and you, you walk up to your minister, Brother Dave, Brother Dave, he always looks good, you know. He always looks good. And you shake Brother Dave's hand, you think, man, this guy's got it made. You know, he's smart, he's good looking. But you may not know what's going on inside of Brother Dave. He's got an inner conflict just like I have an inner conflict. I'm sure there's a lot of people at my church that think the same thing about me, that they think a lot of folks here maybe think about Brother Dave. But they don't know what we may have been dealing with last night. They don't know what we may be dealing with when we mount the pulpit on Sunday morning. Because this is an internal struggle. Actually, this struggle begins with the new life. It doesn't end when you're born again. It, it only begins when you're born again. Amen. We need to get that straight with a lot of new converts. See, people think you're baptized, I'm it, it's it. You know, it's over. I'm in now, right? As long as I take communion every week, I'll be okay. But actually, the, the struggle just begins when we're born again. Amen. This conflict, Paul says, is because the holy law of God awakens the unholy nature of man. That's why it happens. Paul says, I was alive before the commandment, or I thought I was alive before the commandment came. And then sin sprang to life and I died. You know, we all think we're pretty good until we compare ourselves to the law. If, it ever, if at any time you think you've arrived, just compare yourself to God's holy law. There's nothing wrong with the law. We should never put down the law. We are the problem, not the law. The law is perfect and holy. We're not. And whenever that commandment came, my sinful nature was steered up, so to speak. And really, the amazing thing about chapter 7 is this, right here, in a nutshell. Paul is talking about what I have called the two eyes. The two eyes. It's kind of confusing. You know, you, when you just became a Christian, you read Romans 7, you think, my goodness, I do what I don't do, and I do what I don't want to, you know, it's kind of confusing. The language there is kind of confusing. Until you're in Christ for a while. Then you come back and you read it and think, man, I was just feeling that way yesterday. But Paul jumps back and forth from one eye to another. Did you notice that? Have you noticed that? First he says, I am a slave to the law of sin. Then he says, I am a slave to the law of God. Well, that's a contradiction. Which is it? Well, both are true. Because there are two eyes. Amen. I have two people in me. There's a little poem that we like to quote. Two natures beat within my breast. One is cursed. The other blessed. One I love and one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. There are two eyes. Two eyes. Now the fact that we deal with this conflict, the fact that we have two eyes, that makes for some major handicaps 
and some major limitations. That's basically what Paul is saying. See, sometimes we're so busy in this conflict, we can't do what we would like to do. Sometimes we're so much on the defensive in this subduing the flesh that we can't go on the offensive. There's a lot of things we'd like to go out and really do for God. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I want to, want to you know, take the world for Jesus. But we, sometimes we're so much on the defensive that we don't have any energy left to do those things that we would. There are some handicaps. There are some limitations. You know, and we should always remember this when we meet together in the church. Don't ever begin to think that your brother or your sister in Christ has, uh, has arrived, that they don't need help. Um, we always need to remember that we have handicaps. Don't be disappointed when brother so-and-so falls. Yes, I know it's, it's not good, it's not normal, but don't put people on such a pedestal that when you realize that they have weakness, you're devastated. I hope you understand what, you, what I mean. We should look to Christ in that way, but not to one another in that way. We should realize that we have handicaps, we have limitations. And sometimes those handicaps and limitations get the better of us. And don't expect so much from people that you're always disappointed. Now the good news here is that even though we have two eyes, two natures, two people, the sinful nature, the old eye, is not the real eye. That's the good news. Praise the Lord. That old I that is a slave to the law of sin within my members, that's not really me. Now that is liberating, let me tell you. When we're in this conflict, you realize that the part you're fighting is not you anymore. The real you has been born again. And folks, we we need, we need to teach this in the church. We've got to teach this to believers. Believers have to know that. Young believers have to know that. At Oak Grove, just on Sunday, I preached before we came here to, t- to uh, Indiana. And there's a young lady in the church who's just become a Christian a few months ago. And uh, she's married. She's about my age. And when I preached on Sunday, she began to weep. And when I offered the invitation, she came forward and she was weeping. And when she came forward, I, I whispered in her and I asked her, I said, have you been baptized? And I thought she had, but I wasn't sure. And she said, and she was crying and she said... <laughs> And it's kind of funny, but I know what she means. She said, yes, but I don't think it took. <laughs> and afterwards, Ada and I were sitting, we were talking with her, and I said, you know, your problem is, you are dealing with your old man. And she'd never heard that before, and she brightened up and she said, you know, you're right, because the old me wouldn't even be here. So we've got to teach that, because people need assurance. We need confidence because, think about that. If, you know, what if Romans 6 through 8, what if somehow we found out through modern scholarship that those aren't in the earliest and most reliable manuscripts? You know, what if we found that out? I, you know, there'd be times when I would wonder if I was really in. Because I have this struggle and I might think, well, where did that thought come from? I must, I must not be born again. Where did that... Where did that weakness come from? I must not be born again. But uh, we can have assurance and confidence because of the things that Paul wrote here. Conflict and sonship. Even in the midst of our conflict, our sonship is secure. In the midst of conflict, sonship is secure. And that's that's, that's when Paul writes this great verse that we all know, Romans 8 and verse 1, you know it, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the confidence, that's the assurance, and that's basically what Paul is saying in this context. Even though we have this conflict, you you see, in Christ there is no condemnation. Your sonship is secure in the midst of the conflict. Now, someone might misinterpret what I'm saying, that I'm preaching eternal security, I remember one time somebody asked me if I believe in eternal security. I said, yes, I certainly do. I believe in eternal security. I believe that as long as you keep the faith, as long as you stay in Christ, as long as you walk in the Spirit, you can't be lost. You're eternally secure. See, when people say eternal security, they don't mean what I mean by it. And I'm in no... And this... Romans 8, you know, is always used. 
to buttress the doctrine of eternal security. And of course, I'm not teaching that, and here's why. Because if you read the context, that's just the opposite of what Paul is saying. Amen. Paul is not saying you're unconditionally forever saved. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul says you are secure if you kill your old man. Amen. See, because if I don't, I'm not secure. This is written to Christians, written to Christians who have the Holy Spirit, and he says if you walk in the Spirit and put to death the misdeeds of the flesh, then you're a son of God. So it's just, this, this context can't be used to, to buttress eternal security. when they're, It's all conditional, you see. It's all conditional. Your, secure, your eternal security is not unconditional. It's conditional. Amen. There are two laws. There's, there's one law here that Paul talks about. There's a law here and there's a life here. That's what I meant to say. There's the law of the Spirit. Now, that's not a law like this do and live. That's not the kind of law he's talking about. He's not talking about commandment law. It's a principle. The principle of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit gives life. And a person who is governed by the law of the Spirit, that means that they are dominated by the Holy Spirit. That's the law of the Spirit. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is when you are totally saturated and dominated and infiltrated by the Holy Spirit. I remember one of my professors at Ozark used to say in Acts class, Brother Mark Scott, he used to say that the question really isn't, do you have the Holy Spirit? The question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? And then there's this second issue, the life of the Spirit. And Paul says here that you were once dead, but if the Spirit of Christ lives in you, your body's dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. That's the life of the Spirit. He, he kind of goes, he kind of runs with that thought, and he says this life of the Spirit, that, that even influences your thinking. The Spirit has a mind. There's the mind of the Spirit, and there's the mind of sinful man. And so, when we're talking about subduing the flesh, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, that has to infiltrate first our thinking. Subduing the flesh is just not, not doing something. It's a whole new way of thinking. There's such a thing as a spiritual mind. And actually, this is where the battle is fought. This is where the battle is won or lost. It's in our minds. It's in our thoughts. Sin begins in the mind. We subdue the flesh. That begins with our thinking. And then it will move from our mind. It will move from our thinking. It will move to influence our behavior. Amen. You know, when, when somebody's dominated by the flesh, everybody knows it. And when a person is dominated by the Holy Spirit as we're going to hear today about the fruit of the Spirit later on, it ought to be obvious then too. And that's basically what Paul is saying here. That will eventually influence our behavior. The conflict and sonship. The third and final movement here in Romans 6 through 8 is weakness and victory. And this is going to kind of overlap what we heard at the end of last night with Brother Wilbur with the Holy Spirit helping our weaknesses. I'm going to talk about some of those very same things. I hope you don't mind. Weakness and victory. Flesh is a weakness. It is not a strength. Amen. Now I know there are guys you know that walk around all buff and muscular and, and everything and they look really strong but they're really not. They're really not strong. Flesh is always a weakness. In fact we suffer in the flesh. Romans 8 18. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings that's what he's talking about. The, the suffering is the conflict that he just got done talking about. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. Now, again, you've got to study Scripture in context. The sufferings are the conflict that we were just got done talking about. Jesus in Gethsemane. Just about to go to the cross. He's praying. Drops of blood. He goes back to his disciples. They're asleep. What's he say? 
Now he says something to them. I don't think he was really saying it to them as much as he might have been talking to himself. I don't know that. That's just my impression. But Jesus says what? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't that true of us? That was true of Jesus, too. Right there in the garden. You, you know, the apostles were asleep. I don't think he was necessarily saying that to them as much as he was saying that about his own struggle right there in Gethsemane. He was willing to go to the cross, but he had flesh too. And Jesus says, flesh is weak. We can participate in the suffering of Christ. Amen. First Peter 4, 1 and 2 says, Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Amen. In the midst of this weakness, we also, as Brother Wilbur spoke of last night, we have the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been in such conflict with your own flesh that you found it difficult to pray? Now, Contextually, that is the, the flavor of where this is in the text where he inserts this thing about the Spirit interceding. It's in the midst of this conflict. Our flesh is so weak that, and we're, we're in this struggle to subdue it. You've experienced this, haven't you? Sometimes the worst thoughts that I ever have come when I'm trying to pray. Have you ever experienced that? Or you say, you know, we're going to pray now. You know, we're going to set aside this such and such a time every night to pray. And you start praying and, you know, just, just so distracted. And it's at those times, I believe, when we're actually dealing with the flesh, that that is when the Holy Spirit begins to intercede. Because as Brother Wilbur was saying, that's when we're weak. And sometimes we can't pray. And here's the key to the intercession of the Holy Spirit. When we're in this struggle and in this conflict, and we can't pray like we would like to pray, or maybe we can't pray the things that we ought to pray, but we have the right desires in our heart. What the Holy Spirit does, He comes alongside of us as the paraclete, as you've already heard. He comes alongside of us and He takes those desires that are in our hearts that we can't express and He takes those desires to the throne of God and He says, this is what that believer is saying in his heart. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the will of God. I don't want to sin. I'm just having a hard time explaining that to God right now. And the Holy Spirit takes those desires of the heart, because He searches our heart, the text says, and He takes those up to the very throne of God. The weakness, that's the weakness, but this point is about the weakness and the victory. So here's the victory, is in the latter part of chapter 8. You know, in chapter 6 and 7, Paul starts talking about this struggle. But by the end of chapter 8, you know what he says in chapter 8. We all know. God is for us. Who can be against us? We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we have a future hope. Even though we are dealing with this struggle, with this old man, with this flesh, there is a future hope that we have that we are going to be delivered from this struggle. We live in a cursed environment, Paul says. This whole creation has been cursed. You know, you want to talk about environment. You know, I was thinking on the way over here in the truck, I was thinking about what I was going to say, and this thought came to my mind that I hadn't had before. Psychologists tell us that man is corrupted by his environment. But the Bible says the exact opposite is true. Man corrupted his environment. We live in a cursed environment. That's why we have this struggle. That's why you have this flesh. We're actually part of that cursed environment. Paul says we deal with frustration. We are dealing with bondage. And we're dealing with corruption. Amen. And he says that the creation is going to be liberated from that. And as soon as you're liberated from that, the creation is going to be liberated. It's waiting for the freedom of the sons of God. Actually, 
We live in a cursed environment, but it is the spiritual people who feel the curse. The spiritual people are the one who actually feel the curse. You, you know, you talk to sinners, you talk to people who are living in the flesh, they actually feel quite comfortable in the flesh, you know. They're enjoying themselves. But for believers, it's not that way. We're not at home here. We're not comfortable in the flesh. Amen. We feel this curse. See, that's why Christians aren't always happy all the time, see. You know, there's this theology that, that everybody ought to be happy all the time. And sometimes I'm not happy because I'm still in this body. Amen. This has already been said too, but I'll say it again, that the Holy Spirit, Paul says, is the first fruits of our redemption. In other words, what you have from God in the Holy Spirit is a little taste of the glory that is going to come. And the glory that he's talking about here is the redemption of your body. This old flesh, even though it's fallen, even though it's cursed, even though it drags me down, it's going to be redeemed. Amen. I'm not going to go to heaven in this body. It's going to be redeemed. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 2 through 5. For in this we groan. That's the situation in the flesh. Earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. In another place, Paul said, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. We are saved by hope. Amen. We're saved by hope. This hope, this hope that our body is going to be redeemed, this hope that we're going to be delivered from this struggle, this hope that everything is going to be renewed. And you know, in Revelation, John said, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. And if you're born again here, you'll fit in there. That's the, that's the point. Now, in conclusion, just, just a few concluding thoughts here. If you continue on with this context of Romans 8, you see what God's future purpose really is. And he says it in that, our, one of our favorite verses in verse 28 and 29. Isn't this good to know? That in the midst of all this struggle, we know that all things work together for good. To those who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? Verse 29. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined. Here's the purpose. To be conformed to the image of His Son. That He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus is the firstborn of a new race of men. He's the second Adam. Amen. And we're like our big brother. We're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. Think about that. Out of the iron furnace of conflict is going to come a whole body of people who look like Jesus. Amen. But see, we've got to go through the furnace first. We've got to be shaped and molded and, and this conflict is what does that. The, the conflict, folk, is, is how God's going to conform us to His image. Amen. It's, see, it, it starts here, it's just going to be finished at the resurrection. Amen. See, the, the resurrection, nobody's going to be actually transformed in their spirit on the resurrection, at the day of the resurrection. Amen. That's just going to finish the job. God told Jeremiah, you know, go down to the potter's house and I'll give you a message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him shaping a, a jar, but it was marred. And so he threw it away and he made a new one. He made a new jar. And that's what God is doing in Christ. God's purpose is that we will be glorified. But before we can be glorified, we must endure the suffering. See, in the kingdom, the suffering always comes before the glory. Amen. We must learn to rule our flesh before we can rule in glory. Amen. And Paul even says we have some consolation here in the midst of this struggle in the world. We have an intercessor. Not only the Holy Spirit, but here in context, Paul also talks about the intercession of Christ. Amen. 
Look at verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. There's the consolation. Amen. Now, if I could be perfect now, if I could always subdue my flesh, if I never sinned, if I never had any shortcomings, would I need an intercessor? I think not. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet was without sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. When Paul ends in this great, majestic doxology at the end of chapter 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does that mean? If you look at everything that we've been talking about. It means that believers who walk in the Spirit can expect to overcome. There's no doubt in my mind. There shouldn't be any doubt in your mind that as long as you walk in the Spirit and put to death the deeds of the flesh, you are going to be more than a conqueror. This provides us with comfort in conflict and gives us a reason to rejoice. As the prophet said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. I love the, the old hymn, Oh to be like thee. And I love the third verse, and it has a lot to do with what I've been talking about this morning. The third verse of that hymn, Oh to be like thee, goes like this. O oh, to be like thee, while I am pleading, pour out thy spirit, fill with thy love. Make me a temple, meet for thy dwelling. Fit me for life and heaven above. In the midst of this conflict, in the midst of our efforts to subdue the flesh, that's actually our prayer. That's our goal. Is that when we subdue our flesh, we become filled with the Holy Spirit, that we want to be a temple, meet for his dwelling. We want to be fit for life in heaven above.